Hi everyone, we're talking about how people get infected with tapeworms from consuming raw or undercooked fish. So we're going to talk about the tapeworm species that cause infection. We will also talk about how they infect the patient. We will also then talk about the signs and symptoms of an infection, how these types of infections are diagnosed, and how they're treated and prevented. So what is the fish tapeworm? So the fish tapeworm may also be referred to as the broad tapeworm, and it can look like this. Like other tapeworms, the name tapeworm actually comes from its appearance. It can look like a piece of tape. It can be flat in appearance. And although the title of this lesson is the fish tapeworm, there are actually multiple species of tapeworms that can come from fish that can infect humans. The most common being Diphylobothrium latum or D. latum. This is like other tapeworms, a gastrointestinal parasite, but in the case of Diphylobothrium latum, humans are the definitive host with regards to this species. And the other common fish tapeworm species are known as Diphylobothrium nion cayens and Diphylobothrium dendriticum. So each of these tapeworm species comes from a different type of fish. With regards to Diphylobothrium latum, it can come from fish like pike and perch. With Diphylobothrium nion cayens, it can come from salmon. And Diphylobothrium dendriticum can come from whitefish. And this is another picture of what this tapeworm can look like. And being infected with these diphylobothrial species causes the condition known as diphylobothriasis. And this is going to be something we're going to talk about throughout this lesson. Each of these species are going to cause very similar signs and symptoms. So when we talk about the condition of diphylobothriasis, it can be due to infection with any of these three species. Now, diphylobothriasis is more likely to occur in middle-aged male patients. But other than that, there is not much known as to the patient predilection for this type of tapeworm. And in fact, the true prevalence of this particular condition is unknown in many countries. But it is estimated to affect 20 million people worldwide. And again, it is likely underdiagnosed. Infection with some of these species may be on the decline due to improvements in sanitation, but it may be on the increase in other parts of the world where raw fish is being consumed. So it's unknown as to the true prevalence. And what is important with diphylobothriasis or infection with some of these diphylobothrial species is that they are important causes of vitamin B12 deficiency, which we will talk about later on in this lesson. Let's talk about the pathophysiology behind a diphylobothrial infection. So it all starts out with a definitive host like a human that is infected with this particular type of tapeworm. With regards to diphylobothrium latum, dogs and wolves can also be affected with this as well. So the definitive host will pass these unembryonated eggs from the tapeworm in their feces. And these unembryonated eggs then enter into water source and embryonate to become what is known as a coracidia. Coracidia are then eaten by little crustaceans in copepods. The coracidia will then develop into what is known as a procercoid larva within the crustacean. And then a small fish will come along and eat that crustacean. And then what will happen is that a procercoid larva will then develop into the infective larval stage known as the pleurocercoid larva. A bigger fish will come along and eat the smaller fish becoming infected with the pleurocercoid larva. And then a human patient or some other definitive host like a dog may come along and eat that infected fish. And this is how the cycle continues. And then that pleurocercoid larva will then develop into an adult tapeworm. So the summary of the infection is that a patient is infected with pleurocercoid larva, the last larval stage of this particular type of tapeworm, through oral ingestion of raw or undercooked fish. It will develop into a tapeworm or an adult tapeworm and will then use its scolex. Its scolex is the head of the tapeworm, so this is what a scolex looks like here, to attach to the gastrointestinal mucosa or the inner lining of a person's small intestine. The tapeworm will then absorb nutrients through its flat segmented body. So it has these little segments that we will see here in a moment, which are known as proglottids. And eventually these proglottids or these segmented pieces will mature. They contain eggs and they actually break off and are excreted in the stool. So some of these little proglottids can look like this. With regards to these different bothrial species, the proglottids are wider than they are longer. And if you look inside the proglottid, you can see these packets of eggs. And here is another image of what these proglottids can look like on a tapeworm. So again, these will break off from the long main chain of the tapeworm to be released in the patient's stool as unembryonated eggs, and then will enter that cycle we just talked about. So again, what happens here is that a patient will consume oftentimes freshwater fish, and 
these freshwater fish can come in a variety of different dishes a patient might eat, including sushi, sashimi, Scandinavian marinated fish fillets, ceviche, and tartar maison. So those are dishes that contain raw or undercooked fish. And if the patient eats one of those types of dishes or anywhere that they may eat raw or undercooked fish, and if that piece of fish has the larval form of the Diphylobothrial species, the pleurocercoid larval stage, they will eat that and then the larval form or the larval stage will then enter into their gastrointestinal system. So here is what the inner lining of the small intestine looks like with villi and microvilli. These increase the surface area in the small intestine to allow for nutrients to be absorbed. And then what will happen is the larval form, that pleurocercoid form, will then take time to develop into the adult tapeworm. That adult tapeworm will then use its scolex, which is noted here, to attach to the inner lining of the patient's intestine, and it can grow quite long. And in fact, Diphylobothrium latum is actually the largest or longest parasite known in humans, ranging from one meter to 15 meters in length, so very large. And this type of tapeworm species can live for up to 25 years, so it can live for a very long time. And it releases roughly a million eggs per day, so it is a very large and very long living species of tapeworm that can cause issues in patients. So what might some of those issues be if a patient is infected with one of these diphylobothrial species? Well, in fact, most are actually asymptomatic, meaning that they don't have any symptoms at all. If they do have symptoms, they're going to be often vague gastrointestinal or GI symptoms. But what can be noted with these patients that's going to be more specific for a tapeworm infection is that they are going to have or could have a passage of the proglottids or larger tapeworm segments in their stool. So some patients can see the proglottids or segments from the tapeworm in their stool. It can look like a piece of rice or some little white or yellow specks in the stool. So that's going to be more specific to a tapeworm infection. Some of these other symptoms could occur in other conditions, including abdominal pain and discomfort. And patients with diphylobothriasis can also have issues with indigestion or dyspepsia, this kind of gnawing sensation in their epigastric area. These are actually going to be the most common signs and symptoms of diphylobothriasis or an infection with one of these fish tapeworms. Some other important signs and symptoms include anal irritation and pruritus or an itching sensation. So this can cause pruritus ani. So this is something that can occur due to the passage of those tapeworm segments. Patients can also have issues with constipation and or diarrhea, and they can have issues with fatigue as well. We can also see headaches occurring in patients with diphylobothriasis. They can have sensation of hunger, and they can have issues with an allergic reaction, so they may have a rash that could occur in some patients. And like other tapeworm infections, there could be rare complications that may occur from diphylobothriasis, including gastrointestinal obstruction. So you can imagine if there are many different tapeworms within the gastrointestinal tract, they could cause a partial or complete gastrointestinal obstruction, which would then lead to symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and distension or abdominal distension where the abdomen becomes distended or extended outward. Some patients can have subacute appendicitis, so the tapeworm itself or parts of the tapeworm may block the opening to the appendix leading to appendicitis, which is an inflammation of the appendix. And then in some cases, the gallbladder and the outlet to the gallbladder may be obstructed, leading to cholecystitis, so an inflammation of the gallbladder as well. So all of these are very rare complications of a tapeworm infection, but they could occur in some patients. And what's going to be most characteristic with this type of tapeworm infection is going to be a vitamin B12 deficiency. So a vitamin B12 deficiency is going to occur in approximately 40% of patients who are infected with a diphylobothrial species. And why this happens is that in some of these diphylobothrial species, like diphylobothrium latum, diphylobothrium latum, for instance, causes a dissociation of vitamin B12 in intrinsic factor complex. So intrinsic factor is important in attaching to vitamin B12 to allow the proper absorption of vitamin B12. So diphylobothrium latum causes dissociation of this mechanism. 
And a vitamin B12 deficiency is more likely to occur with longer duration of infection. So if a patient's had the tapeworm for longer periods of time, they're more likely to have a vitamin B12 deficiency, and it's more likely to occur in larger sized tapeworms. That makes sense. If you have a longer tapeworm, they're absorbing and disrupting more of this vitamin B12 in intrinsic factor complex. So it's going to cause or increase the likelihood of a vitamin B12 deficiency occurring. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of a vitamin B12 deficiency? Some of them include neurological issues. So vitamin B12 is important for two enzymes in our bodies. And when those enzymes don't work properly, there can be some toxic byproducts that can accumulate and they can lead to some neuronal issues or neuronal damage, leading to some of these neurological issues, including symmetric paresthesias. So paresthesias are these numbness and tingling sensations. It's going to be symmetric. So it's going to be on both sides of the body and so it could be on one leg and on the other leg, for instance. They can also have a shuffling gait because they can have issues with proprioception, which is balance. So they can have issues with their balance. And then they can also have issues with two-point discrimination as well. So there can be poor two-point discrimination in patients with vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency can also lead to psychological signs and symptoms, including depression and decreased cognition. And then vitamin B12 deficiency can cause a macrocytic anemia. The thing about the vitamin B12 deficiency in diphlobothriasis is that it is unlikely to cause macrocytic anemia. So in other cases, this vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to this particular type of anemia. But in the case where vitamin B12 deficiency is caused by this fish tapeworm, it's unlikely to cause a macrocytic anemia. It's going to be rare where only less than 2% of patients are going to have this type of anemia. So what is macrocytic anemia? Macrocytic anemia is a low hemoglobin count. So anemia, so it's low hemoglobin and it's macrocytic, meaning that the cells are larger in size. So the MCV or the mean corpuscular volume is greater than 100. That is the definition of macrocytic and it is megaloblastic as well, meaning that there is issues with DNA production. Some of the signs and symptoms of a macrocytic anemia include fatigue, shortness of breath, pallor, glossitis or an inflammation of the tongue and dizziness. So these can be some more important findings to see with a vitamin B12 associated anemia. So again, glossitis being an inflammation of the tongue. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose and treat these conditions. So the diagnosis of diphlobothriasis, like other tapeworm infections, is by looking at the stool for ova and parasites. So ova are going to be the eggs of the tapeworm and the parasites are actually the tapeworms themselves. So stool, ova, and parasites are going to be important in diagnosing this. And what's important with looking for these ova and parasites in a patient's stool is that oftentimes multiple stool samples are going to be required. So in the case of many tapeworm infections, if only one stool sample is checked, ova and parasites may not be found in that stool sample. So oftentimes a patient may need two to three stool samples on different days to actually see whether or not they have or don't have this type of tapeworm infection. Some other ways of diagnosing this include copper PCR and copper AG ELISA, which is serology testing. And then certain blood work can be important, although it's not what is going to lead to the diagnosis, but it can be utilized to see if they have any other issues associated with this type of infection, including a CBC, so complete blood cell count. So again, as I mentioned before, it can cause macrocytic and megaloblastic anemia in a very rare cases. So very rarely it can cause this type of anemia. Mild eosinophilia, which is a mild elevation in eosinophil count, could occur in this type of tapeworm infection. Eosinophils are important in fighting parasitic infections, so we can see an increase in this type of cell. And then it's also important to check vitamin B12 and folate levels because patients could have a vitamin B12 deficiency. And then in some cases, imaging may be required. So an upright abdominal x-ray may be important if there is question as to whether or not there's a gastrointestinal obstruction. And then abdominal ultrasound could be used in some cases. There have been cases where the tapeworm can be seen on the abdominal ultrasound. So it can look like a hypoechoic ribbon-like structure inside the gastrointestinal lumen. How is this condition treated? So anti-helminth therapy is going to be important. So it's going to be medication. And the medication of choice for treating a diphlobothrial infection is going to be praziquantel. So praziquantel is going to be the main medication for treating a diphlobothriasis infection. So this is going to often be in the dose of 25 milligrams per kilogram, single dose. So only one dose is going to be required. Other cases may be treated with niclosamide or elbendazole. 
And because these types of tapeworms, these fish tapeworms can cause a vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin B12 supplementation can be important. And oftentimes, they may be given intramuscularly because there may be some issues with gastrointestinal absorption of the vitamin B12. So the intramuscular IM injection of vitamin B12 may be utilized for that reason. Now that we know how these types of infections are diagnosed and treated, how can these types of infections be prevented in the first place? So hand hygiene is going to be important. So if you touch raw fish in cooking, for instance, it's important to have good hand hygiene. And then on a population level, it's going to be important for having primary and secondary sewage treatment. So these types of sewage treatment can be important in reducing the release of those unembryonated eggs into the water sources where crustaceans can eat them. So that would prevent that first step in the pathophysiological mechanism we talked about before. Screening fish for parasites before consumption is going to be very important. And then if one is to cook the fish, it's important to ensure that fish is cooked to at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius. Some other sources may say at least 63 degrees Celsius. Flash freezing fish can also be utilized as well to help neutralize and destroy some of those pleurocircoid larvae within the fish. So flash freezing is where the fish is frozen at at least minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 35 degrees Celsius for at least 15 to 24 hours. And then some sources also say that storage of the frozen fish should be at minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 35 degrees Celsius. And other sources say that freezing fish to at least minus 20 degrees Celsius for at least seven days is required to help neutralize those pleurocircoid larvae within that raw fish. If you want to learn more about other types of tapeworm infections, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.